how's everyone doing? <laughs> We're all sweating. <laughs> really good. Drinks are at the back. Thank you all so much for coming. My name is Chloe Perifokin, in case you didn't know and are meeting me for the first time. And it's also a reminder to old friends on how to pronounce my last name. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to my wedding. I'm joking. <laughs> Thank you for spending your evening here with us tonight. I came here 10 years ago to pursue my dream of being a writer by attending my creative writing MFA program, but it is all of you who came here tonight that have made my dream a reality and San Francisco a home. And so I'm a speculative fiction writer by training. So obviously I've been working on a short story collection. As many of you know, writers tend to work on multiple projects at the same time. And so when I found myself stuck in writing short fiction, I began writing essays to confront and excavate my experiences here as an extraordinary alien visa holder. The title of this reading comes from my essay collection in a manuscript and process, uh, process, progress, Extraordinary Aliens, which consists of 10 essays that explore the myths of Asian American exceptionalism and the damaging effects of meritocracy through the lens of a Thai Chinese non-immigrant, me. I use alien as a metaphor throughout the manuscript as a way to blend personal narrative with reportage and cultural criticism. Stylistically, I adopt already existing structures outside of literature, such as form applications, mathematical equations, and letters to contain each essay, highlighting the patterns and links in our language that prevent us from empathizing and working with one another. I'll be reading a more narrative piece tonight because that's just shorter and more fun. Before I do, I have to give my gratitude to all of you who made it possible, including the Zoom. Um, thank you so much to the San Francisco Arts Commission for funding and supporting my writing for many years and to Kern Street Workshop, Jason, and all of you who are volunteering on your Friday and for giving me countless opportunities to grow in our community. Thank you, Preeti and FT, for saying yes to the dress, but also for <laughs> um, And my students who make me a more patient person, shout out to some of my online viewers, Tara, Zoe, Francis, Jacob, Hajun, for making my BTS live stream party come true. Um, please give yourselves a holler and a hoot and applause for being here. <laughs> I'd like to start off this event by introducing our first reader who shared a similar journey to me and who has contributed so much to our community with her courage, her vulnerability, and her words. Preeti Bengani is a poet and writer who grew up in Mumbai. She's the author of Mother Tongue Apologize, winner of the RL India Poetry Prize. Her work has been published in Three Penny Review, Gulf Coast, Portland Review, among other places. A graduate of University of San Francisco Chemical Program, who likes them. Um, Preeti has received fellowships and support from UCROS, Garaki, Pen America, and the California Center for Cultural Innovation. Her debut short story won the 2021 Pen American Dow Prize for Emerging Writers. She is currently working on a manuscript of poems and a collection of short stories. Let's welcome Preeti with another round of applause. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I think I can go on record to say I would do anything that Roy asked me to. Uh, <laughs> I moved uh, from Bombay, which is the only city I ever lived in, uh, when I was uh, 31. And I moved here for a creative writing program at the University of San Francisco. Uh, before that, I trained myself by going to business school and I worked in marketing for eight long years. And I slowly sort of realized that I wanted to pursue the arts and made this very late stage decision. Um, and in 2018, at the cusp of my student visa expiring, I was sweating literally metaphorically from everywhere. And I remember sitting with Floyd at 
the films on Castro and just told him, like, I don't think I have a future here, although I want to continue writing, I don't know how. And she literally sort of opened the big complex book of visa applications for me and guided me here. So honestly, thank you so much, Floyd. Thank you for believing in me, for supporting me and having me here. Um, this first poem I'm going to read is kind of like um, an intergenerational original story. The word Dada that appears in the poem means paternal grandfather. Uh, Papa is obviously father. Um, and it's named after the shop that my family owns. Um, my dad and his two brothers along with my grandfather, um, who we lost recently, um, run a sari shop in Bombay. And the sari shop is named after me. Preeti Silk House, shop number 15, Kota Market, Mumbai. Come fall, working at a daycare in Noe Valley, having white Californian butts, I rolled $80 into a Goodwill Patagonia West, wondering how my dad's chest must have flipped when he caught himself snoozing on that train in 1947, barely 16, uprooted by the jungle of genocide, 80 rupees in his pocket, and grandma, 30 in the room, at his heel. He lucked out two seats on the train from Larkana, now in Pakistan to Ajmer, now in India, bodies magnetized over, around, atop the train, the way bugs swarm a lid bulb. Then, having spooled and unspooled floor to ceiling long cotton hands as a mill worker, saved his wages to buy a sari shop. A nine by nine spot, rechristianed after me, where his three stubble sprouting sons promenade in silk, georgette, and risque nets, draped over their formal button downs, fabric tucked into belted waist, packs raw shacked in sweat. Did, did my dear Dada ever imagine them? Dentures in Petri dish, a Sindhi hymnal from the old country by his pillow, pages, eggshell, persuading his granddaughter against moving to America and for what? With an, is this the last time gurgle in my gut, I hugged him goodbye. At the door, he gifted me a thin blue towel, a symbol to say, I got you covered. Then in the stairwell, do what you want. Poetry cannot be taught. It is a gift from God. When the news came, war was what it promises to be, war. India was 73, running out of cremation grounds, oxygen auctioned on the black market, some profiteer repainting fire extinguishers as oxygen canisters, and you, Dada gone. Not of the plague, though. We are lucky, Papa consoled me. It was peaceful. Lucky indeed. I've never needed to believe in God, yet each Sunday, Dada saved me a samosa anointed by the Gurudwara. Blessed and crunchy heaven, you, 91, older than free India and way more democratic in your anger and admiration. How to mourn someone older than a nation with the notion that they held not your exit against you? Travel, his trial, my liberty, yet something unfree clangs within my muscular pocket, the way Papa cascades the rolling shutters beneath my name. Iron squeaking, clanging, he double checks the lock and says, maybe today I will be able to catch the fast train. Also, shout out to Kearney Street Workshop. I have absolutely loved every single time I've been here, whether it was a volunteer for Aperture or performing at Aperture, and just coming back here gives me so much joy. Thank you for always having these doors open for me. And thank you for everyone working from home. So over the pandemic, um, I am a hyperventilator by nature, and a lot of that is also because I lived with chronic pain. Um, I got arthritis. 17 years ago and I lost my mother to cancer when she was very young. So um, at the start of the pandemic, of course, I was hyperventilating, but uh, in order to sort of commemorate that side of my me, I started to make a list of everything that could almost kill me. This poem is called, It Almost Kills Me. Arthritis, it's triggered. A damp morning, Fahrenheit drops and rain, tannins in red wine, stairmaster climb, hills and heels, hills on heels, gluten, nightshade, hard spirits, not enough steroids, the wrong steroids, stiff neck, sitting cross leg, the hand therapist affixing a strip of foam around my toothbrush handle, squeezing a nail cutter with opposable thumbs that no longer oppose, 
my mother aching for God to do his job, clumps of her hair coming off. I did not witness her silken fall, regrets confusing as side effect pamphlets, breast cancer month and pink bows on children's heads, Jodie Comer on Killing Eve, the woman in the sequin dress on 8th Street with her rolly backpack whispering to her good poodle, ain't no one gonna touch us, baby. Britney then and Britney now, the blues and afternoons my fingers almost don't shake holding the ear of a cup, Amy Winehouse singing when I come back, immigration policy, that it was my mother who got all our passports made, hers will never have a stamp, the Second Amendment, scent of lemon trees and Mount Camp Gris with dried figs on a cracker, explosion of salt and the fruit's good sugar, it's sun on my tongue, this insufficient body, this body, well or not, a well of want. The ways you and I not, the word not as bounty, as in that's not nothing. Forest fires, lightning, my vibrators pass the setting. <laughs> Um, I have primarily been writing into uh, the grief from losing my mother and I've been doing this for what seems like a lifetime, but realistically about 10 years. But I often think that I've ridden myself into a kind of sadness that my mother would not approve of because in reality, she was a very, very light hearted and a very, very humorous person. And I wanted to memorialize that aspect of her. Um, so I started writing poems in my mother's voice because mine was too sad. <laughs> my gone mother wants me to love myself, says. So your oldest friend turned out to be a Republican. Isn't it great you toot and fuck? <laughs> no, you don't look like a puffed up bag of chips in that dress. Listen, a sparrow cheeps at the kitchen window, short buzz, long thrill, the thrill of your nighty swishing against mine at nap time. Your skin is so oily. How is America not fracking on your T-zone? <laughs> I'm packing Multani Mitti in your bag, a walnut scrub, honey with cinnamon, and have you tried praying? God is an easy customer. I wish you said I love you to me as you did to the boys in college. Is this what we gave you freedom for? HPV? <laughs> Nothing apple cider vinegar can't cure. When your nanny died, I was back to cooking dinner the same night. Dal, chawal, fulka, crispy aloo, the way your papa liked it. I liked Varun. Why did you leave him? Are you ever happy? You'll find a Mills and Boone in my side drawer. Go to page 71. Page 71. Where's that unicorn you promised me? Asks Miranda. Oh, wait, never mind. I can feel it in your trousers. <laughs> if you don't finish your beer, use it as hair conditioner. If you can't find alcohol, spit on the wound. Marriage means sacrifice. Your father's heart attack is not your fault. And cigarettes are healthy for bad marriages. Take care of your teeth. I found you. I found you on a Thursday in the rain, water rushing in and out of your gumboots. I held you up by the waist and did not let go until I lay you in the room where I sang and waited and sang. Sorry, I fell asleep. And then when I get tired of poetry, I kind of switch to fiction. Um, so this is a very... Um, rough and unready excerpt from a short story titled Orientation Walk in which the main character um, who has newly come to America is trying to seek a writer's residency and she's been shortlisted but she doesn't know whether she's gotten in or not and the residency in California has organized um, a hike for people to come and orient themselves to where the place is. So she's standing together with all the other potential um, residents doing introductions. All of us potential residency holders are introducing ourselves, standing in a circle at the trailhead, the Pacific glinting clear and blue in the distance. I used to be in sales, I say. Now I'm a poet. My life is like slumdog millionaire, but in reverse. <laughs> LOL, Stacy the sculptor says, not laughing. <laughs> I introduce my white boyfriend, Pat, as my partner. 
my first time I realized saying partner not boyfriend. What brought you to writing? Maya, the installation artist, asked me. Now, I like to remember my dead mother in any context, be it small talk or an artist statement. I have learned through the stack of rejection letters, although emotionally accurate, is an overly simplistic way to present the magnetic crush that pulls me to the page. That made me roll down the shutters on my life at 34 and move to Silicon Valley for an unfunded MFA where most people who look like me crunch code to service our tech overlords and can afford $7 matcha lattes on the reg in the warmth of their puffy vests. So, the omniscient and non-linear nature of grief, I tell Maya, is why I write. I work with familial archives to reconstruct the conversations we've missed having with the departed, a kind of anthropological study in verse. I say feeling not like a person, but a museum. Finally, Bach, who is currently based in Oakland, but my heart is in New Jersey, a 40-something man introduces himself as just another bi-coastal wanderer. He is a visual artist and hands each one of us his visiting card and a dossier of his exhibition on display at a gallery in Manhattan. When he falls one shot, he runs to his car and returns with another stack of dossiers. I look at Pat like, are we to carry his portfolio through the nature hike? Just some of my basic work, Bob says. I also engage in photography, dabble in plastics, glass, and love setting materials on fire. And my guilty pandemic purchase is this thick pottery wheel in my backyard. Jealousy circuits through the whole of my inside. I remember how my parents made me give up years of Bharatnatyam dance training in 10th standard to return my focus to studies. Extra curricks won't get you the best college Rani. How my mother's voice rang as she packed away my gurus. More than angry at that time, I had felt defeated. Maharashtra State Board exams were after all truly competitive. There was never spare time to imagine what existed outside textbooks. I feel my nervousness, bite my finger, and I think Pat kind of senses my relative unpreparedness. And he whispers, don't fret. Next time we'll get you visiting cards at Kinko. Cheap and easy. Put a poem at the back. Although printing should really be free or at least subsidized, at this point in late capitalism, it's a basic human right. <laughs> Here's a list of things I've heard Patrick say should be subsidized. Housing, bread, milk, phone chargers, books, public transit, and marijuana. <laughs> He is a real hammer and sickle guy in the streets and a $6 pack of boxed water drinker in the sheet. <laughs> I don't blame him. I have contradicting ideology defined pleasures too, unethically made speakers, for example. Pat works as a copywriter for a grocery delivery company that sells imperfect looking foods to minimize wastage and pays him five times my library assistant salary, alongside shares and three fortnightly produce, from which he's carrying a snack of dented gnarly baby carrots in his backpack. While waiting, Bach and Pat partake in deep gummies and moan the demise of what San Francisco once was. They discourse about rent, drug addiction, property prices. The word gentrification is tossed around like a tiny silver ball being flipped and released inside a pinball machine. Uncertain if the purpose of this walk is for me to judge the place or for the place to judge me, I keep nodding my head in vociferous agreement. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for me. Thank you for reading about vibrators. <laughs> um, our second reader also has one of the most wicked and fiercely sense of humor, the sharp eye for injustices and uncomfortable observations on race, class, and ethnicity is none other than F.T. Cola, who was born in South Africa, grew up in Australia, and lived in the UK before coming to America. She holds an MFA from the Missioner Center for Writers at UT Austin, and was a 2019 and 2021 Stegner Fellow in Fiction at Stanford University. I'm glad we dragged one of the Stegners out here. <laughs> in 2015, she shortlisted for the Kane Prize for African Writing. Her work has been published by One Story, Branta, New Contrast, and The Guardian. She has that work on her first novel. Let's give it up for FT here on the stage. Huh. 
try and let me see if I can put this on the on. I am so excited to be here and I'm so grateful to Corey for inviting me. Um, it's kind of weird, like if you are a member of like five different hyphenated groups, <laughs> like, <laughs> realizing actually that you might be a member of one more and also like realizing that you need that like in some nourishing way. Um, I haven't actually, uh, you know, um, I feel like I'm still understanding myself as a Asian American person and this is my first visit to Kitten Street and my first sort of reading where I'm with other people in that group. Um, and it's amazing how like life giving it is. <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, but I'm very happy to be here. Um, I uh, am, would also go anywhere, Chloe. Uh, <laughs> In her like stunning fancy look, I just like. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I'm gonna read you a little bit from the actually the only story I've ever written that's set in the U.S. Um, I tend to set stories in Australia where I grew up, um, and I think that's because I'm afraid of being able to say, "This is my home. I'm a citizen of this place." Um, and there's something about writing about a place I think that like suggests you have an ownership or a familiarity with it, which I'm scared to do. So this is actually a story that I've been attempting to work on for like fully now eight years. My friend Jacob heard me read some of it at our MFA graduation like 100 years ago. So, um, so it's very much a work in progress. Um, I'm going to read from the middle, but just to kind of uh, let you guys know where the story is at the moment. Um, it's about two brothers, uh, age 21 and 17. Like me, they're Muslim, South African, uh, of Indian descent, new to the United States. Uh, they move about seven years before the scene that you hear. Um, the old one is called Muhammad Tariq Muhammad the Younger because his father is called Muhammad Tariq Muhammad the Elder. So <laughs> he's about 21. His younger brother is called Rashid. Um, they're from New Jersey. It's the last days of the Obama presidency. Um, and the way they got to America is their rich uncle Suhail, who owns a mall in Livingston, New Jersey, uh, sponsored them and their father to come. And the only other thing you have to know is that Muhammad Sharif Muhammad the Younger, who is the older brother, um, is currently um, being arranged to marry a girl called Maryam, who's back in Texas. And so this is their first trip to Disney World, which <laughs> <laughs> Muhammad Tariq Muhammad the Younger and Rashid checked into the Animal Kingdom Lodge at Walt Disney World one late July night with two new suitcases from Lot Pullets containing moisture wicking t shirts, sun hats, fresh cotton socks, sunblock, incense repellent, band aids, neosporin, ibuprofen, their prayer mats. Muhammad Sharif Muhammad the Younger had insisted, swimsuits and six boxes of protein bars. <laughs> Muhammad Sharif Muhammad the Younger had done all the packing because in his hours of research, he had concluded that a trip to Disney World was a feat of endurance <laughs> and had repeatedly cornered his brother in the house and painted for him portraits of long marches, marches in the sultry Florida heat, incurring blisters and risking hypothermia. He had also, in the lead up to the trip, watched a total of 65 Disney animated movies. Every single one, the Livingston Public Library and, it, and the power of interlibrary loans of plunder, including obscure items like the Black Cauldron and Bambi II. For his part, Rashid had come to view the trip as a charitable mission. It was clear his brother cherished the idea of the two of them together, out in the world on a great adventure. Who else could he go with? He barely left the house. Disney World would be the most momentous occasion of Muhammad Sharif Muhammad the Younger's life, Rashid got sadly, before he settled into an eternal domestic torpor with a perfect stranger. But on the plane, listening to Muhammad Sharif Muhammad drone on about dull whips and the fall of presidents and worry over whether his request for halal meals would be honored, a tendril of excitement began to tentatively unfurl inside Rashid. The trip was the first time he had left New Jersey since coming to America. The first time he had been away from his parents. 
He knew that he did not have his own or his parents or so many of his friends or his cousins. In fact, he had come to resent his parents' lack of ambition for him. He was envious of the tiger parents he witnessed, the ones who taught endless piano lessons, who became obsessive about spelling bees, who declared it was Harvard or Buzz. In South Africa, his cousins had viewed his father as the nice uncle and had often mentioned how lucky Rashid and Muhammad Sharif Muhammad were. Their father never belted them for a bad report card of a missing madrasa, never threatened to send them to an unaccredited medical school in Mauritius in the belief that a family without a doctor wasn't a family worth knowing. Rather, Muhammad Sharif Muhammad the Elder, in a remarkable, dis remarkable display of what was commonly referred to as white parenting, often declared that he only wished his boys to be happy. <laughs> but rather than evidence of his father's kindness, Rashid had come to think of this as proof of his small-mindedness, his laziness. His father would not have gone anywhere in life had Suhail not, like a visiting angel, lifted him up and carried him away to marry. Rashid wanted a bigger life, and it was slowly becoming clear to him that he would need some distance from his family in order to build it. Perhaps in Florida, even with his brother, even within the new world, some glimpse of it would be possible. The boys' hotel room was small and frighteningly expensive, with two bunk beds and a spotless, a surprisingly shabby bathroom, wallpapered with a profoundly inaccurate map of the African continent. <laughs> Muhammad Sharif Muhammad insisted that they get up at 7 a.m. so that they could arrive when the park opened, and Rashid obeyed. He went to the toilet, brushed his teeth, splashed water on his face, dragged on a t-shirt, and was ready. But Muhammad Sharif Muhammad spent close to an hour in the shower, another 30 minutes anointing himself between his thighs with anti-chafing gel and another 15 fussing over the choice between whisking a pair of Crocs and cargo shorts to wear. The long XL, 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 XL stickers yet to be unpeeled. <laughs> then he insisted on refolding his towel into the Mickey ears that had been on his bed, and on taking photographs of the view from the balcony, a grassy field upon which it was said that giraffes, the new and ostriches free roam. But at present only contained an aged man in a fluorescent pink t-shirt, smoking anxiously and screaming at someone on the phone. These were to send to Miriam, with whom he was communicating constantly. By the time they left the room, it was close to nine. In the hotel's breakfast room, a giant approximation of a boma designed with plastic mud and such, thatched with jungle noises and drum beats piped in somewhere near the ceiling, Rashida Muhammad Treat Muhammad ate Mickey-shaped waffles with rich cream. And Muhammad Treat Muhammad consumed three glasses of a sickly concoction called jungle juice that had given Rashid a pounding headache after a few sips. Rashid felt really that he was holidaying alone. Everything was photographed and WhatsApp to marry him for her benefit. And Muhammad Tariq Muhammad spent his time gazing at his phone and giggling at what Rashid had seen to her inane responses. Have you noticed, Rashid said, that the waves out here are all from Africa? Muhammad Sharif Muhammad didn't bother to look up. They're not called waiters, he said. They're called cast members. Everyone here is from Africa for authenticity. It will be the same in Epcot. All Moroccan brothers in Morocco. They have halal lunch for us, mashallah. He held his iPad aloft to photograph the table of Pagla princesses in technicolor rayon gowns. Rashid turned away, embarrassed. Throughout the meal, Rashid tried unsuccessfully to strike up a conversation with their South African cast member whose name had announced that she was from Freiburg and her name was Sika Leila. So she had greeted them with a confusingly resounding jumbo, but she had proved to be as professionally blank and friendly as everyone else they had met so far, and completely disinterested in his declaration that they too were South African. Fake Africa was suppressing. For months, Mohammed Sharif Mohammed had been going on about the genius of the Disney Imagineers, how they were architects of delight, how they spent endless time researching the tiniest matters to get every detail correct. And so what Rashid had expected of Disney Africa, the entire continent, had been unclear to him. But what he had not expected was this. Africa abstracted out to some kind of imaginary essentialism, almost humiliatingly unfamiliar in its familiarity. Nor could he conceive of how to make it better of what would have been a more authentic version, of how to recreate the things he missed about Johannesburg, 
different surely from what was written about Nairobi or Lusaka or Cairo. The summer storms, the way they rolled in from the high veld every afternoon, the way they left the city smelling damp and wet and hot, a mixture of petrol and fragrant air, adding to the top notes of clean laundry and dry food. The way that leaving early for school on winter mornings, the air would be so fresh. It would be liquid and never be touched. The taste of toasted steak sandwiches from the cafe down the street. None of these would be implanted here in this humid Florida swamp. If he had been called upon to design this approximation of his homeland, he might have done it exactly the same, reduced it to symbol, to its most recognizable diluted feature. The horrible thing he realized was that he didn't know his home anymore. To know something required constant contact. The moment you left a place, even a place that had been yours, you lost it forever. All the little incremental change is natural to somewhere. A prison is converted into a luxury hotel. The train conductors get replaced by machines. Your favorite restaurant becomes gross, accumulating your absence. Until at some point, what was familiar is a sort of depressing nostalgia, intolerable to anyone who still lives there. The type of stuff you once scoffed at. Over time, you would only be left with everything quiet and stereotypical. If he went back to Joburg again, it would be like looking in the face of a friend who once knew a long time ago and now knew nothing about. He did not share this thought with Muhammad Sharif Muhammad, but the deflated feeling remained with him all the way to the Magic Kingdom, on the bus, on the monorail that sang faintly like a barnyard, and then through security at the entrance of the park. Mohammed Sharif Mohammed walking thoughtfully in front of him, surprisingly curvy at the hips and backside in his new cargo shorts. <laughs> they passed under a decorative archway and came out into a postcard city plaza. Ahead of them stretched a long avenue, punctuated with candy sellers and children carrying balloons and trellis buildings. And there, in the distance, Cinderella's castle rising majestically behind it all, and the American flag rippling in the breeze. The brothers stood in companionable silence side by side, and looking at the same thing for the first time since morning. How well ordered it was, how beautiful. Rashid felt unexpectedly his heart rip, strangely moved. Here they were on Main Street, USA, in the Brazilian sunlight. He felt triumphant. He reached out to touch his brother. <laughs> You can find my bio online. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is Flocker Pokin. Um, I was born and raised, uh, well, I was born in Thailand, raised in Hong Kong. And uh, yeah, yeah, right here. <laughs> I'm going to be reading from my essay, um, Here's Your Grandchild. Growing up, my mother cleaned my plates of rice and noodles, tossed prawn chips, cookies, and my self worth out of cupboards scolded me for buying larger sizes at Uniqlo. She and my father sat me down in various restaurants and secluded rooms in my grandmother's house and in our brown Mercedes Benz to remind me with the level of gravitas reserved for news about a death in the family that once my belly protruded out like that of a pregnant mother of five, I'd never be able to zip into a vice set designer wedding dress. Your body attracts the wrong kind of men, they said as if kind, good men judge women by their dress sizes, as if the label on the back of a sweater determined the quality of character I deserved in a partner, as if straight men even bought their partners correctly sized clothes. <laughs> when I turned 30 and still had no need of a wedding dress, they blamed many things, my writing aspirations, my immigration from Hong Kong to California, my American habit of inquiring, how much will this cost up front? When no matter where they began, they'd inevitably end up driving their blame train back to my body. And up until my surgery, I believed them to be right. There were two surgeries, actually. The first one was on January 10th, 2021, a day before my 33rd birthday, when I was admitted to the ER in such agonizing pain that the doctors assumed my appendix had burst. 
When they tried to confirm it with a scan, they discovered their view was impeded by a cantaloupe-sized benign tumor above my uterus. Unwilling to risk the complications of sepsis, they cut me open immediately, only to discover my appendix was shelving and thriving. The tumor wasn't cancerous, and it wasn't the cause of this pain, but it was crushing my organs, uterus, and spine in an unnatural way. My ER surgeon rustled me awake at four in the morning, waiting printouts of the scans. Did you know you have a fibroid the size of a baby's head in you? I did. Why didn't you take it out while you were in there? I asked, the beats of my heart monitor quickening. I had first been acquainted with the fibroid upon graduating college 11 years earlier in one of Bumming Rod's hospital's marble floored offices during a vaginal ultrasound, which the doctors had invited my parents to attend. <laughs> As I lay on my back with my legs in stirrups, my mother asked if the probe hurt when inserted. No, I said. She gasped. Is it because you're having tons of sex? <laughs> I was. <laughs> I didn't care if I had sex 200 times with one person or one time each with 200 different people. I was acting not out of desire, but out of need. I needed to prove that I was attractive as I was, that this curved, bouncy body of mine was worthy of meeting other soft, hard, hairy, smooth bodies wet with craving. Having sex gave me purpose, a sense of dignified usefulness that my otherwise still resting body did not have. My value was tied to what I could physically offer, and my partners responded enthusiastically, as most teenage boys do. Some of these boys stayed and called me their girlfriend. Some of them left. Yet whenever the sex was over, the pooch in my belly remained, a reminder that no matter how high I arched my back or how hard I strained to point my toes as I tried to escape into 20-minute romps, I was still weighed down by this boulder inside of me. Nothing I did could excavate it or my feelings of lack. During my last year of high school, a white boy had spread the word about my boring hand job, snickering to his friends. She tugged and tugged and nobody came. I gathered that had I been skinnier and ergo a prettier prize, he wouldn't have dared utter a single chuckle. No one bad enough pretty skinny girl, at least not to me. So when the Bumumrod nurses showed me a bolus floating above my uterus on the black screen, like a manatee bobbing near the coast of Florida, I took this to mean, we have scientific proof that your feelings are valid. We are medically diagnosing your problems as not your fault. They suggested I keep an eye on it and on any symptoms that worsens over time. Don't concern yourself with it now, they told me, but this may require surgery in the future. What I had mastered about pain was this. You become used to what you endure. If you're Thai like me, enduring is part of your blood. You oton, the word ot meaning to bear to exercise the strength, to have control over, and the word ton meaning to be durable, permanent. To be time means to pride yourself on your sturdiness, on pain-proofing yourself to survive. In sixth grade, long before I knew the role the fibroid played in it, I was humbled by my period. Cramps tore through my stomach like a werewolf in heat, leaving behind a homicide of stained school uniforms, blood red underpants, and muddy feet. It became commonplace to receive a doctor's note to miss school, then work, and even bachelorette parties one week out of every month. Changing into men's sweatpants, fainting in hot, humid summers, and being force-fed Chinese herbal medicine were also part of this inconvenient routine. The medicine singed my throat all the way down to my small intestine, but it alleviated a few of my symptoms temporarily. I'd ask my mother to concoct something even more disgusting with twigs, insects, and tree bark such that knocking back a cup would wipe me out forever. It never occurred to me that there might be an underlying medical cause because my Thai Chinese parents and extended family chalked it up to my modern westernized lifestyle. It's because you drink ice water instead of warm water, they say. It's because you play too many sports after school instead of studying physics. It's because you were born earlier than your scheduled C-section, thus incurring the wrath of Thai soy and all the animals in the zodiac who thunder down on your rebellious nature. My friends with similar period pains were given similar explanations. Our parents weren't stupid, but faulting us was easier than admitting that they didn't know how to fix what was wrong. And since Yahoo was our only recourse, if we could even afford a computer at home, we gargled these superstitions in our mouths and gulped them down. I didn't want to give my parents even more opportunities to impugn my body, so I held all the suffering inside to what point? to triumph over the pain. 
But when you learn to ignore that kind of pain, how can you follow your doctor's orders to keep an eye on it? How can you discern if it becomes worse over time? My first surgery, an emergency, had struck me off my teaching roster and pummeled me financially for months. So I elected to have the fibroid removed in July when my body would be healed and I wouldn't be teaching anyway. One month before the surgery, I sent my parents the CT scan of the blood suckling fibroid with the caption, here's your grandchild. <laughs> I even bestowed a name upon it, Fibre. They were not amused, but I felt justified. My fibroid surgeon walked me through the operation Fivey would be peeled like an orange and dragged out of my belly button like a rope woven out of muscle, a process that would take eight hours. I'm not sure we should give the fibroid a name, she said. I like to personify the things I no longer want to hold on to, I said. She assured me that there was only 0.01% chance that I would die from any of the five complications possible with a myomectomy, but still asked for the name of my power of attorney. Because we were in a pandemic, kept apart by global quarantine restrictions, my parents couldn't be there in time. So I forced my best friend of 30 years into the role. If they had to amputate my arm for me to survive, what would you say? I asked her. Wait, why would they need to amputate an arm? Say yes to the blood transfusion. Make sure they resuscitate me. I want to hate you for ordering me to hike the dolomites for your goddamn bachelorette. Then I prepped my parents. Natasha is going to make any medical decisions until you arrive, and then all the power to kill me will be transferred to you too. <laughs> My mother cried. You must be so scared going through this all alone. She sounded genuine, but her comment enraged me. I've been enduring all this pain, insecurity, and doubt for the past 33 years, and my parents have been blaming me for it the whole time. They only considered it debilitating now because there was suddenly a 0.01% chance I'd wake up dead. And maybe because I promised that if I did, I'd haunt them forever. <laughs> I didn't know how to accept their sudden concern for me or how to plan for post-fibroid life. What would I do if I couldn't prove my worth through suffering? If I didn't have a medical diagnosis to blame my insecurities on, I'd no longer have a monthly scapegoat for my feelings of lack, no more clamping down on anguish with gritted teeth to demonstrate my tenacity. I woke up alone after eight hours of surgery and chewed on two graham crackers to prove to the nurses I could keep food down before being ushered out. Hospital beds had to be emptied for other non-COVID-related ER patients. My friends, colleagues, bosses, and even two ex-boyfriends who rose from the deadlands of blocked numbers showed up. I received cookies, infinite bouquets of edible arrangements, and cards featuring the loves of my life, the K-pop band BTS. My parents weren't as gentle. When it became clear I would survive, they switched from crying for me to chiding me for not getting the surgery sooner. My pain was no longer my fault for crawling out of the womb too early. Now it was my fault for ousting Phoebe from the womb too late. They seemed afraid of being kind as if other fibrous grandchildren would see it as an invitation to move in. In a roundabout way, they were right. My surgeon told me the fibroid had been nurtured by my hospitable hormones welcoming uterus, and this is a direct quote, cute fallopian tube, <laughs> as if my body, having received only hate for so many years, tried to divide its cells and split apart to form a new body immune to my parents' shame, a non-cancerous tumor was the best it could manage. In the mirror, I saw myself on the side. My belly was flat. After a lifetime of dieting, swallowing laxatives, and strangling it in shape where my cooch, that flesh solid mass, was now cooch. Gone. Suddenly, I could sprint at Barry's boot camp any day of the year, lull on blankets in Dolores Park for hours without running to the bathroom, and bleed normal amounts of unclotted blood once a month. I sang like a lean, cackling post divorce adult. I'd proven my parents wrong on their own terms and persevered to sachet in leather leggings to and from the grocery store. My lack seemed to have vanished as though my insecurities had been hauled out of my belly button like a string. Yet my ecstasy was accompanied by a more complicated feeling. In a deadly pandemic, when many Americans couldn't afford healthcare, when millions of people around the world were dying or losing their livelihoods due to COVID, was I really celebrating how darling I looked slipped into a biased cut gown? The Thai word for hollow is flown, which sounds like an echo of six rattling an iron cage. It's a derogatory slang term for vapid Instagram influencers who show off the newest it bag in their latest haul videos or for anyone else who lacks the substance and intellectual weight to ground them. 
even though my surgeon had promised me that I'd be able to curse her during childbirth, even though my writing and teaching schedules were locked back on track, and even though I'd met my health insurance deductible, which meant the 90,000 operation cost zero dollars, I felt hollow. Did I really need to be sliced and diced like tuna belly sashimi in order to achieve self-esteem? It was as if I was only considered worthy if I was either enduring great suffering or inhabiting a body that my parents had praised, instead of saying I'm intrinsically valuable and desiring and deserving of love with or without five E. If you pounded my uterus from the inside out, you'd hear the reverberations in your fist. Learn. My first monthly OK trip was to Palm Springs for a bachelorette party, where a few of the bridesmaids wanted to solve the problem of me being single. You can't expect to meet men from your couch, one offered. Maybe you'll find the one at a BTS concert, another said to be named. Maybe I just underwent two surgeries this year and want to spend time alone, I said. My new form needed more time to settle and strengthen to fortify itself against outside judgment and unsolicited advice. In New York for the bride's wedding, several months later, I bought coffee from Soho to the Upper East Side, danced with friends until four in the morning in Brooklyn, offering to spit in one of their eyes when he complained that his contact lenses were dry. <laughs> Met up with an ex-boyfriend who had mailed me an enormous gift basket and then taken me out to a tasting menu dinner to celebrate my survival. Before we slept together, I checked in with him. Are you okay with this being no strings attached? Are you okay with it, he asked. I want to show off my new body to someone who wants to see it. Let's not do it if it's a chore for you. He laughed. It's not a chore. He didn't leave my bedside the entire weekend. While he snored loudly on the pillow next to me, I tried to remember. Why did we break up again? He had confessed he couldn't do it anymore, our long distance, which meant he didn't want to commit. I had cried for days, falling into the phone, my pillows, a hand towel, wondering what was wrong with me. Why wasn't I enough? Was it my body, hidden in baggy clothes, my never-ending physical travail, and all those excuses for missing out on life? What did I lack that he had to search for elsewhere? That was five years ago, and the hurt had faded, like the small red scars from my surgery will do someday. In the dark, I cuffed my ex's tight curls and kissed his forehead. What a handsome, sensitive man who was trying to make himself relevant again in my life. Maybe the breakup really had been about the distance, or maybe blaming it on distance alone was too simple, but it was much closer to the truth than blaming it on the idea that I had the wrong body type or was bad at hand job or bled through my skirts with terrible mood swings or suffered too much or didn't suffer enough. I had spent my life thrashing like a sea creature caught in a net, relentlessly pounded by the current but never trying to gnaw my way out. I ought on, waiting for an opening on the surface instead of figuring out a way to the top on my own because I was worth living for not because I was strong enough to endure whatever came my way. As I caressed the scruff peeking out of my ex's jaw, I thought that if he wanted to keep me, he'd have to grab on tight because I'm no longer holding onto the things that don't want me. From now on, I'm going to be harder to catch. Mm -hmm. So you are ready for some of the food eggs?
that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you what yeah, we can we can field the question. Anything. Thank you for coming, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Question for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. um, have your parents read your life? Of course. Okay. Um, what is what was the last one? Um, well, obviously, my dad threatened to disown me. Um, he is now in the land of delusions, and he's like, well, surely it's fiction. Right. So, so that that was the end of that, and we never talk about it now. <laughs> Sometimes, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. no, I was like, sometimes I feel gratitude for the awkwardness that exists between my parents' generation and me because so many tough things can just be struck there with a topic. Mm -hmm. That's all I think. Uh, well, all of you are just so talented. I was just thinking about how you guys are so was there a defining moment where like, I hit rock bottom or like insert X, Y, and Z here and this is why I want to make a change? You know, I wish there was one moment because then I feel like if the, if the thing was, I mean, if my life was a film, that's the montage, but no. Um, I think I was always drawn to the arts since I was a kid, um, but what, because I was just such a well-scoring student, my parents thought that it would be right for me to go to pursue commerce and economics. They, they always thought that science is too hard. She can't take all that pressure. They kind of knew that I was very sensitive, but I don't think there was enough like knowledge and articulation about the fact in my family, especially that that sensitivity can be put to use um, in the arts. And, you know, I think what my parents were seeing around uh, the time that I was going to college was that kids who get lower grades go to arts. So like anybody who is you know, a bit of 80%, you go to arts, that's what you do because you're not serious enough. So kind of chose the middle path. And then I think I chose marketing instead of like finding a place of science systems or finance because I was like, that's where the creativity is. But um, I mean, soon enough, I realized that in my marketing career, I, I love the people I work with, but in parallel, there was this culture of uh, open mics for stand-up comedy and poetry that kind of became active in Bombay. Uh, traditionally, in our other languages, it's been active for generations, but so to say, we speak in bones. Um, and I started attending those and my interest kind of grew. And that's when I knew that I wanted to sort of make that center stage in my life and keep marketing in the background. And I feel incredibly lucky that I have come to a space where it's completely out of my life. <laughs> We got a request from the Zoom. If uh, we can repeat the question so that the people okay. hear. Oh, yes. okay. Or if you want to ask the question into that mic right there, we can do it. Are there questions from Zoom? Oh, yeah. If anybody, in the Zoom, if anybody would like to ask a question in the Zoom, <laughs> please feel free to do so. <laughs> well, I think Saranya. So the question is, why do you write? <laughs> um, I'm not really sure. Like I uh, like pretty. I I'm kind of actually neither writing. I had a different career. Um, uh, I was a public defender before I moved to before I started to do this, and for very similar reasons, my parents were like, "You can't. You're not good at math, so you have to do law, not medicine." <laughs> and I like, you know, went pretty far in that. And I, I, I didn't write for about uh, 12 years before choosing university and deciding to switch. But I did read a lot. And I guess the only thing is like, I thought about it all the time. Um, I like really liked the work I was doing in many ways. And I felt that it would have been rewarding, but there was something wrong. There was like, you know, I, I felt like I was um, a person who was married to someone they loved, but they were in love with. And I could never stop thinking about this other thing. And so I just thought I had to give myself a chance to do it since I seemed to be obsessive with everything. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I think the simple answer really is because uh, when I'm with the blank page, I can be with my mother in the most. Um, I really hate platitudes. Uh, when my mother passed away, I think rightfully so. When people were trying to, you know, seem too emotionally, everybody said, "Don't cry, my darling." Along with you know, all of the gestures of warmth, and there was a lot of warmth. I can never deny that, but. Um, I've never had the opportunity to talk um, in this unbounded, tender way about my mother's life, even her own sisters. Um, and, you know, maybe the problem is at both ends. I don't need the effort, they don't need the effort. So for me, it really is, uh, I'm my mother's daughter, my father was the one who left. So it really was like losing my best friend. Um, and I had her only for 20 years. So I'm like, the least I can do is uh, be, be in those moments again. Um, and there's also the twinness of like, uh, you know, when I lived with my mother and my father, there was always the idea of mother and father, and I kind of was the idea of daughter. I never quite put one on one in terms of tenderness and love with them. Um, so a lot of like writing kind of uh, is, it like reaches me how to love. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I just can't stop. I feel like even if I try to take a break, even when I was recovering from my surgery, the first thing I wanted to do was write, um, read and write. Um, but growing up, I was very good at math. I was also very good at science. Um, <laughs> the only one was also amazing at sports. Um, but, but yeah, the, the future was all bright. And, uh, <laughs> you know, slap my parents in the face by two <laughs> Yeah. Who are your favorite authors? Um, Hillary Mantel, oh. who passed away today, is extremely important to me, and I just uh finished reading um, all of her work um, and so uh, there's something about her obsession um, with the, the life beyond the veil, um, her obsession with London uh, literature, like that was the one that had a kind of haunted city that um, really appeals to me and her need to constantly stay in history, um, so she's very important to me. Patricia Highsmith is like my dead girlfriend. <laughs> I think she was like the best. I think she deserves a status as an it girl. Like nobody knew that she was like going out every night, like bringing home ladies and then 5 a.m. drinking a vodka orange and like writing a novel. And like she's like a Texan prince that like came to New York and just like dominated so <laughs> And um, but I'm gonna book someone I'm obsessed with because I just think like some of the world genius who wrote in his third language and I think they said a lot of um, beyond anything. Um, there's a South African writer called Miriam Tlali who uh, I, uh, my parents had a paperback book that I would always look at called Soweto Story um, that I was really, really uh, interested in. Um, and I think it had uh, a great influence on me. Um, when I started my MFA and we had to go around the room and say a book we read and enjoy, I couldn't think of anything. So I said The Da Vinci Code, which I've actually never read. <laughs> I was born to it. And then um, <laughs> I packed it to be applied to be like, are you okay? <laughs> 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 So I'm feeling just a little bit like that right now. <laughs> Five people who are really important to me, but I'm really proud that I didn't just say the thing. It was a good book. <laughs> Can I say one thing? Anne Rice. Mm, yeah. mm, she went to stay. Yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, I love Shed Chang. Um, 
Arundhati Roy um, for writing fiction and nonfiction. And then um, I do love Roxane Gay, sort of. I, I like her mind. I like how she thinks and approaches different topics. There's a poet, she's alive and thriving, and just won a really big prize, and it's rarely ever taught um, in like so many workshops I've taken. Her name is Meena Kandasami. Um, she's from the southern part of India. She's a badass feminist and a you know hardcore activist. Um, and she taught me a lot. I think when I read her book, Miss Militancy, I knew this was it, like this was possible. I mean, I had secondhand copies uh, when I was in college of Heavenly Militancy and Mary Oliver, and that stuff was like always alive in my head. But when I read Miss Kandasami, I knew how to talk about my home. You know, this is like why I was in India, but all the things is just so important. Um, fiction. Um, I absolutely love Bath Greenberg. Uh, if anybody, I mean, I know there are a lot of writing students here. If you ever get a chance to take a class with him, he's absolutely fantastic. Um, and I am super, like, in terms of working contemporary writers, I absolutely love uh, Nathan Vedani, mm. uh, whose book Cluster came out last year, and Nisha Faria is just a guy from Church Lady. Now going to be a television or movie, I think. But, uh, all of them are so fantastic. I think I veer towards uh, writers who are like in the gesture of like thinking, so like not unknowingly, but uh, also just massively entertaining. I just love like being in a box of big book clothes. So yeah, those are my favorites. Victoria Chen, big, big influence, uh, lots of thematic similarities, but she is so fantastic and she is so committed. Uh, to craft as well as the story of the life. Uh, I think she's like, been a really big influence to me. I have a question for you. Um, when you were talking, when you read your poem that was in your mother's voice, and you were talking about like almost, uh, you know, like unearthing conversations with the dead, I just wondered how a, is some of that like your method, or do you go through like? you know, text messages, how do you um, do that? And also, do you find that, do you want the voice to be very accurate, almost like she's speaking, or are you trying to go for an approximation of her voice? That's such a wonderful question, thank you. Um, my, my mother passed away, um, she never had a cell phone, so uh, my dad had a cell phone in the house. Uh, so there are very few artifacts that are still on me over here uh, that belong to her. But one of the things that I have is a diary that my mother had possibly started in her second year of college, and she studied home science, and it's from a cooking class. So it's just a lot of recipes. But um, I think akin to doodles or just journaling, uh, she was also a very spiritual person, and she would write a lot of like spiritual writings down, or whichever temple, I don't know the temple she went to. Um, but in between all of those massive paragraphs of like why is endurance she has this you know vitamin a b c d e and e stands for endurance d stands for discipline and stuff like that um there's a sentence spread in the middle of the diary which says love yourself so i picked up the title and it's just like it stands out so brightly to me and i was like she's asking someone to love themselves and that's how the poem sort of take, took shape um, I think I cheat a lot because it's almost like, you know, wearing my, uh, the two kind of bifocals. So it's like, sometimes it's her voice, sometimes it's mine. So it's, it's always in that blurry space. For example, I, uh, my mother would have known HPV, but she would never have said it out loud. So I sort of like work around the borders, but I try to like, uh, you know, in, in Hindi, there's a word, which is cholkarna, which is basically like, you know, like verbally doing this to someone and spiking them to say something they don't want to. And I love that feeling. So it's almost like I'm teasing her and she's teasing me back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Any questions? Yes. Uh, this one's kind of tricky. Um, so each one of you is a writer um, that is uh, not born here in the US. So in terms of the term like Asian American, what does that mean to you? 
Okay, let me just repeat that for Zoom. So being non-US born writers, what does the term Asian American mean for each of us? Um, well, I became American in 2019. I became a citizen. And so I um, am still in need of the concept of uh, feeling like an American to that the lot on top of it. Although I will say that um, I find it very easy to call myself an American. Um, I imagine that had I lived in the continued to live in the UK and had citizenship there, if I had gotten a British passport, I never would have been able to call myself British. And I think that's um, because America does let you be American the second you become American. Like that's something you want to everywhere you're a right to call yourself that it's not an it's not a type of sort of ethnic connection of any sort of maybe but for me um I find this way of being American um both comforting and ridiculous um like a uh, you know African writer or it's um a really weird way to say that my great grandparents <laughs> who lived in India on the same continent as born Britain. <laughs> it's totally different. Like, it's such a broad, like, uh, area of land. It's, it's contains so many sides of cultures that it's insane that, like, you know, it, it got together. Um, and it's a very American thing. Uh, I have, my lawyer from UK were recently complaining that People kept emailing them saying, in honor of an Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and they were like, What are they talking about? Like, this is strange. Um, because, you know, it, I, I feel like um, the reason that it's um, clean to anything that's like or anything that's similar, uh, you're defined by what you're not. Um, and you find comfort in very broad categories and because you're treated as a category then you start to develop similar experiences sometimes it makes me angry um during the COVID pandemic uh when they would report COVID deaths um by ethnicity and they would say well asian and white deaths are the lowest um that's not true south asian deaths from COVID were very very high um and the reason south asian itself um, is a group that only exists because of colonialism, the uh, epigenetic heritage of the British Empire has created a group of people whose similarity is that they all have the same provenance, and that's what it is to be South Asian. Um, and so I feel like it can flatten, uh, it can uh, misguide, it can be absolutely so weird when you think about it. Um, but it's truth is that we are together and we do belong together because we're not the default and the way we're treated is similar because of who we're I feel, I feel, we should have down. <laughs> um, I, I also agree. It's when, when do you take on this hyphenated identity and histories and experiences that are not your own but when do you start to share them you know how long do you have to be in a country to be accepted in that group versus not and I always used to define it um, by sort of citizenship you know like I, I can't call myself that but I think America is a very unique place where you can obtain the citizenship as opposed to just birthright um, and so when do you start calling yourself that? And then the other delineation for me that has been muddled um, is taxes. <laughs> um, because I didn't have to pay American taxes until recently when, um, of course, I pay federal all that if the IRS are watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but they're asking now for taxes as though I'm an American simply because I have been on the soil for a certain time. And, I think that's so funny because I don't have any papers um, to to suggest such. Um, so that's something I'm I'm fighting right now. It's such a it's such a fresh and absurd question for me because I'm coming up to six years. Um, I feel like I'm a daughter there, but I'm a writer here because my writing life kind of uh, took off in America. I'm 
still on an artist visa and might become a citizen in a few years from now. Uh, which unfortunately also means that, you know, as Indians, we can't have dual citizenship. So you have to give up your citizenship. And until recently, the middle used to be that, oh my God, how can I give up my Indian citizenship for very genuine emotional reasons? But when we look at the world for the last 10 years or so, the growth of fascism in India, in America, as in many other countries, is almost like parallel train tracks. So the way I see my life unfolding is moving from one fire to another. Um, and the whole world is on fire. So I find these silos kind of strange because I think I was very young, but I wonder what my grandfather would have said to my father when he was young. Are you Indian? And my grandfather would have been like, but all of that was also India and somebody came in, you know, who came and drew a line suddenly in mouth. Um, mangoes are Indian, pizza, I'm American, <laughs> yes. Um, but honestly, I feel a lot of gratitude uh, for being a part of you know Asian American groups, especially in communities like these, because um, at least I feel like um, my voice is valid. I mean, you know, when I'm in in my room writing the blank page. There is the imposter syndrome, but there is also the opposite of that, which is like, yes, bitch, this is good, keep going. <laughs> um, but it's also good to get reassurance from, you know, other writers and sit in a room and be like, yes, this is a very slow and irritating process. Um, so I think um, it's essential for my survival, I mean, for the survival of my work, uh, but also myself. Uh, I feel very, very uh, grateful that I can be seen. I think that's a great question from Amazon. Thank you so much again for coming out.